Okay, I think we are online. Uh, very welcome, everybody, for this evening's uh, keynote lecture. Uh, my name is Sven Kalmering. I work for the Center for Boarding and Scandinavian Archaeology in Schleswig. And uh, tonight I have the pleasure as a moderator for this work keynote to present uh, Volker's lecture, which will approximately uh, take some 40 minutes. But before I give the word to our speaker tonight, I would like to introduce uh, Volker Hilberg to you with some short dates on his career. Uh, Volker was born in 1967 in Marburg, and he studied pre- and proto-historic archaeology, historical auxiliary sciences, and medieval history at Philips University at Marburg. In 2001, uh, he received his PhD for a study on the migration period bow fibulas from Missouria in Poland, in German titling Masurische Bügelfibeln, Studien zu den Fernbeziehungen der Völkerwanderungszeitlichen Brandgräberfelder von Daum und Kilan. In 2002, uh, the year afterwards, Volker received a, a university reward of Marburg University for outstanding doctoral studies. And his thesis was published as volume nine in the Schriften des Archäologischen Landesmuseums in 2009 in Schleswig. The same year, 2002, um, Volker became research associate at the Archaeological State Museum, uh, Archaeologisches Landesmuseum, at the Schleswig-Holstein State Museums Trust at Gotthoff Castle in Schleswig. Uh, in 2004, Volker became uh, in charge for the museum's archives. And in 2015, he became the deputy uh, to the acting director, as well as the curator for the medieval collection. As a scholar, um, Volker has an um, impressive scientific output of uh, up to today six monographies, and he published uh, additionally 54 papers in periodicals and anthologies. Volker had teaching engagements at Kiel University, at Aarhus University in Denmark, and Brno University in the Czech Republic. Volker is a member of the International Saxon Symposium, uh, a member of the Commission on research on archaeological collections and archives of Northeastern Europe at the Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz in Berlin. And he's also Schleswig-Holstein delegate at the German Numismatic Commission, where he, in between 2004 and 2014, acted as a secretary. Volker has been on two advisory boards, at least, I'd say, um, between 2009 and 2013. Volker was at the advisory board for the World Heritage Serial Nomination Project, Viking Monuments and Sites. That was their first attempt to turn Hedebu into a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Uh, we'll hear more about that in a few minutes. And Volker was also between 2016 and 18 on the advisory board of the research and excavation project Vikingerborn at uh, Kühe on Zealand in Denmark. As a researcher, uh, Volker has been uh, dealing with Hedeby for almost uh, 20 years by now. Uh, since 2002, he was responsible for the field research in Hedeby, starting with large-scale geophysical surveys and metal detecting. In 2004, he contributed to the special exhibition, Current Research in Hedeby, at the Viking Museum in Hedeby. In between 2005 and 2010, he was the PI to the Pit House settlement excavation in Hedeby, uh, you, you notice maybe five years, which really set high standards for uh, a high resolution archaeology, you might say. That excavation was conducted in cooperation with the Archaeological State Service of Schleswig-Holstein. In 2009 to 10, uh, Volker contributed to the uh, permanent exhibition, the new permanent exhibition at the Viking Museum in Hedebu. In between 2012 and 15, he was the PI in the Volkswagen research project between Vikings and Hanseatic period, continuity and change at Hedeby Schleswig in the 11th century. The project was applied in cooperation with Kiel University. Since uh, 2019, um, Volker is preparing a special exhibition uh, titling AD 1066, Demise of the Vikings, the North on its way to medieval Europe, which is scheduled for 2024. And uh, most importantly, maybe, Volker just uh, concluded a manuscript um, 
to a quite uh, comprehensive monography on Hedebu AD 983, 2066, demise of a Danish trading center in the late Viking Age, a manuscript which uh, comprises some 780 pages, uh, Volker told me. Uh, this uh, thesis will be published as volume 19 in the publication series Ausgrabung in Hedebu. Tonight, I have the pleasure to uh, um, introduce Volker as a speaker uh, on the first and recent archaeological UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, in Schleswig-Holstein, which is Hedebu. He will give us keynote on uh, the title Research in Viking Period Hedebu from Nazi Investigation to UNESCO World Heritage Site. Volker, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sven. And a good evening, ladies and gentlemen and dear colleagues. First, I would like uh, to thank the organizing committee of the EAA of this year's annual meeting, and especially MERP, Medieval European Research Community, for the invitation um, to this keynote lecture. And um, yeah, in the next approximately 40 minutes, I will go, um, I would like to present to you uh, the Viking period site of Hedeby, as I do know, of course, that due to the pandemic, um, we are all participating only virtually to this uh, annual meeting. And I would like to give you an overview um, into this huge uh, research project and a better understanding. And we are starting um, with the inscription of Hedeby and the Danewirke as UNESCO World Heritage in summer 2018. In the justification for the inscription, it is stated that both Hedeby and the Danewirke are outstanding testimonies to the cultural traditions of Northern Europe in the Viking Age. So between the 8th and the 11th centuries AD. They have become, due to their rich and well-preserved um, archaeological materials and features, key scientific sites for the interpretation of historic developments in Viking Age Europe. Both Hedeby and the Danewirke represent a significant cultural, political, and economic phase in the history of Northern Europe, reflecting the specific nature and the development of borders in connection with the formation of states in Viking Age Europe at that time. The landscape is a unique case study for the development over centuries of the architecture of fortified boundaries in conjunction with trading centers which are strategically integrated into their natural environment. So you have already received a lot of um, information, of essential information about the nature of Hedeby itself. And if we look on this aerial photo from the Northwest, you are looking inside an area of approximately 25.5 hectares and embraced by a massive rampart, semicircular rampart. You can see it here quite well here. It's hidden underneath the trees. And you can see that these are green meadows. So it's not settled any longer since this enigmatic year 1066. And uh, you see um, here two inlets. These water areas are inlets of the Schleifjord, which you can see over there in the east, and the Schleifjord is open to the Baltic Sea. So after 22 nautical miles, approximately 40 kilometers, you are reaching the open Baltic. Um, taking, taking this um, aerial photo and comparing it with such a modern digital reconstruction, of how Hedeby may have looked like in the middle of the 10th century AD, you can see that due to um, massive research since almost 120 years, we have quite a good picture of this place. And um, 
these, this is the basis for the inscription of this site and the adjacent Danewerke as UNESCO World Heritage. Um, when, um, or as a basis, we have to take into consideration that um, the site of Hedeby presents all elements of a large settlement complex. So we do have um, settlement remains, which are especially near the, near the water, near the harbor to the east, um, provided with well-preserved wooden building remains. You can see here the remains of a house. And um, so the streets coupled with wooden planks surrounding the house. Uh, you can see on the right photo, an older photo from 1930, when they were excavating a 520 to 560 meter long trial trench uh, through the whole settlement complex inside the semicircular rampart. So you can imagine until today, we have a high amount of settlement features stemming from the Viking period, but it's not only a settlement, it is connected with the defensive system of the Danewerke, which already starts in the pre-Viking age, which is still in use um, after the Viking period in the, in the Middle Ages. And it served um, not only as a border from Denmark to the south, but it also controlled the traffic on the smallest part of the Jutlandic Peninsula. So you see here to the left, the North Sea, and to the right, the Danish islands, so that's the Baltic. And here at the smallest part of the um, Jutlandic Peninsula, an isthmus situation, the Danewerke um, controls, but it also allows the traffic from one sea to another. The next element, which is quite well known from the Hedeby research, are Hedeby's or is Hedeby's harbor and the Viking and medieval shipwrecks. So we have had large scale excavations in the harbor when the remains of this Viking longship were excavated in 1979. They could enlarge um, um, the excavation area and we uh, could uh, get a good view into the building activities of Hedeby's harbor. And by the way, my colleague Sven Kalmring has analyzed uh, this excavation in a very thorough and wonderful PhD thesis, which has been also published as a very huge book in the Hedeby series. I think most of you who are dealing with the Middle Age, with medieval archaeology know his work quite well. Next to settlement and um, defensive system remains to the harbor structures and the shipwrecks, we also have a high amount of early medieval burials of both inhumations and cremations from the 8th century to the 11th century. So until today, over 1,200 graves have been excavated in various areas all over um, this complex, uh, this settlement complex. And um, most of them have been published in 2011, but there's another smaller excavation led by Sven Kalmring in 2017. And unfortunately, you couldn't uh, visit uh, the museum. We have a museum nearby. It's the Wikinger Museum, Hyperbu, the Viking Museum, Hedeby, which opened in 1985, reopened with a totally new exhibition in 2010, and which attracts thousands of visitors until today. And even since um, um, Hedeby and the Danewerke, were, um, were UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, there, there are so many uh, visitors, it's really incredible. We 
also have a small um, open air museum in the historical area. And um, so if you visit these, um, these um, facilities, you may ask, so what's behind um, this uh, Hidebi settlement complex? What's behind this UNESCO nomination? Or which factors influence this basis um, and how develop the research at this place? And that's what I would like to present to you this evening. First, I would like to strengthen that we have a uniquely rich historical tradition. We have a high amount of written records from several parts of Europe. We have Old Norse um, and Old English uh, records. We have uh, Latin records from the Carolingian and later the East Frankish empires and kingdoms. We have, um, so this give us, gives us a very good impression about this place. So, um, from an historical point of view, the time, Hedebi's time frame is between 804 AD until 1066, when for the last time this place was uh, plundered and destroyed by pagan West Slavonic tribes. And afterwards, the Danish king Sven Estrisen must have decided to transfer the harbor and uh, the settlement and the population to the north of the Schleifjord into the medieval city of Schleswig, which you can see here surrounding the cathedral. So um, that's the historical background and the archaeological background is uh, provided by an extraordinarily long research history, which goes back to the, ninth, to the 19th century and um, due to the two rune stones found in the vicinity, you have seen them two slides before where a place named Heiderbür, <coughs> sorry, is mentioned. Um, Sophus Müller from the National Museum in Copenhagen identified the area inside this rampart as the Viking period um, town of Hedeby. And our museum started in 1900 with the first excavations. I already pointed out that uh, we have a favorable position that um, the whole settlement totally shifted during the middle of the 11th century. So it's an open area and it's perfectly fitted for other archaeological prospection methods like geophysical prospections or systematic surface surveys. Beginning these surface surveys were done next uh, next to the huge uh, settlement excavations in the 1960s. And we restarted them in the early 2000s with, um, <coughs> with metal detecting. So all these investigations provide us with a huge amount of material. So that's behind this settlement complex. And um, in, uh, we, we are going further into detail about this fascination of this place. So when um, our museum restarted the excavations in 1930, um, the people were already still impressed by, um, they had their pictures in their mind. So on the left, you see a small leaflet written by our director, Gustav Schwantes. So a guide through Hedeby with first information given um, from the new excavations, but relying on the, for all the excavations between 1900 and 1915, respectively 1921. And <coughs> sorry, to the right, you see that just six years later, the picture of Hedeby emerged. So it uh, really uh, developed further on and on. And you can see here that uh, that's uh, um, a publication on Germanic uh, prehistory published by a company producing um, things to clean your shoes, Erdal, it's 
explained in German in Germany. And uh, so this company, they published this book and you could, when you bought the, uh, these, uh, these things to, to clean your, your books, you can collect these little, um, these little picture cards and you could put them into this book. And you see that also Haithabu Hedebi played a role at that time and um, the picture developed further on and on. And if we go into um, the public image and understanding of this place in the 1930s in Germany, you can see that the people were really fascinated about um, the situation that um, historically known town or a city, as it was um, a bishopric since, nine, six, uh, since 948, that um, such a medieval town totally vanished and was destroyed and totally shifted away. And archaeology was able to refine it, to, um, to bring through investigations, through archaeological digs, totally new information. And you see that it's also beginning to, um, to develop into a sense of um, a German nationalism. And you will see um, quite soon what happened after 1933. But I'm kidding a bit because the two last headlines are not from the 1930s. They are from the 1960s, from a newspaper from Göttingen in Lower Saxony. And you see from from the style of, um, um, of the information given, it's closely comparable to the public view of here to be in the 1930s. So not so much, um, if there's not such a difference in between. So when we are coming to uh, the excavations of the 1930, I've already mentioned that with the restart of the excavations in, in 1930, the Hidebi research um, was really an advantage situation. So the logistics were growing more and more and uh, the new political situation after 1933 led to, um, to an increase of archeological research in Hidebi, but also at other places. So a closely comparable picture, but a totally different excavation. Uh, the Stellerburg Hill 4 in Dithmarschen. And um, so these pictures are closely um, um, comparable to each other. And that were the archaeological excavation techniques at that time throughout the Prussian province of Schleswig-Holstein and throughout Germany. But Hedeby is in a special way connected with one archaeologist with one archaeologist, and this is Herbert Jan Kuhn. Herbert Jan Kuhn, um, who participated for the first time when he was 25 years old and when he was still working on his PhD at um, Berlin University. And um, so Herbert Jan Kuhn was next to Gustav Schwantes, uh, the driving scientist. Uh, in the Hedeby research and due to his development, to his affiliation with the Nazis and especially with the SS of Heinrich Himmler, also the Hedeby research um, was developing on an immense scale. So um, when um, Herbert Jan Kuhn um, decided to be an SS member in 1937, this had a very positive effect on the further development of the excavations there because Heinrich Himmler and um, the uh, scientific organization of the SS, the Ahnenerbe, which was headed by Wolfram Sievers, they were much interested in this place. And Herbert Jan Kuhn could offer a promising project to the Nazis and especially to the SS. And the SS, which was the elite in Nazi Germany, they really put a lot of effort. So here you can see the main excavation area 
of 1935. And the aim of the settlement excavations at that time were to obtain a precise layout of Hedeby's urban center in this um, area near the harbor, um, characterized by this wooden preservation, as you can see it here on this slide. And this um, aim or this um, strategy was still in use in the 1960s. So um, up to 1969, um, archaeologists were excavating to um, obtain more and more information about a precise layout of one of the oldest urban centers in Northern Europe. So on this slide, you can see this is the old huge excavation um, area of the 1930s. And when Kurt Schietzel took over the Hedeby excavation in 1963, he had to excavate down to the deepest layers, and then he continued to make new large-scale excavation trenches to, um, get to obtain these aims of, um, yeah, of, of finding a very precise uh, settlement layout of a Viking period town. When we are looking at the excavations budget and the development in the 1930s, we can do this quite well for the years between 34 and 39. We can see that after a decline in 1937, there's a massive increase in 38 and 39. And this has to do uh, with the fact that the SS Ahnenerbe took over the financing of the Hedeby excavations in 1938. So Herbert Jankun succeeded with his plans to um, have uh, the Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler as a, as a leading figure in for the Hedeby research at that time. And when we compare it with the total budget of the Ahnenerbe for this year, 1938, it consisted of 700,000 Reichsmark. We can see that they spend about 10% for excavation for the excavation department, and about 40% of the excavation department's budget was used for the Hedeby excavation. So really, an immense amount of money, and uh, the Hedeby research profited and especially Herbert Jankun profited. It is often thought that for his efforts in the excavation campaigns, Herbert Jankun worked together with, uh, official, um, with other official uh, institutions of the Nazi government, like the Reichsarbeitsdienst or even with prisoners. But uh, as every single bill is still existing, we do know that from 1930 up to 39, when because of World War II, uh, the excavations were finished, that they were only working with local workers and day laborers mediated by the employment office in Schleswig. So in this photo, you see here in the center, Herbert Jankun and the other um, archaeologists, Eckhard Ahner, and here is Günther Haseloff, surrounded by the local workers uh, working in the Hedeby excavation. So that was very typical and also directly connected with Herbert Jankun because he had made, um, um, he could rely on good relations with these local people and therefore he wanted them to to participate every single year in his excavation. But if we look in the publications, and if we are relying on Herbert Jankun's um, influential book about um, Hedeby, which was published in its first edition in 1937, we can see that he is um, he's connecting Hedeby um, especially with the German history and with the German, uh, or what they thought at that time, the German king, Henry I, the Ottonian king, the first Ottonian king of the East Frankish kingdom. We know today that in the 10th century, 
as if German understanding didn't exist. So not to compare with the Danes known already from written records, but the people, they felt like Bavarians, like Saxons, um, living in an East Frankish kingdom, but not as Germans. But in 1937 and later on, Herbert Jankun directly linked it with um, a first German kingdom. And if we go um, the last, um, the last chapter of his book, we can count 25 mentionings of German history, of Henry I, of the German Northern March, of um, the first German Baltic uh, harbor, and so on and so on. So the Hedeby research in the uh, interpretation of Herbert Jankun is directly connected with the early history of the first German Empire, so the First Reich, and they were living and um, and working in the Third Reich. So that's very important to note. And from this background, we can relate it to other SS projects, like uh, projects like the project already um, inter already functioning in the late 1930s in Quedlinburg where uh, this King Henry I was buried in 1936, and uh, the SS was excavating for King Henry's burial, but um, they, never, um, they never succeeded in finding this. But Heinrich Himmler, like his um, important, um, not relative, but um, he was aware of a certain uh, of a certain relation to the first German king, Henry I, because Heinrich, that's Henry, um, he um, built up a special cult in Quedlinburg around uh, this supposed first German king. And also a project like Hedeby was of some importance, as we do know from written records that Henry I was in 934 at the northern border of his kingdom, fighting against the Danes and making them tributes to his kingdom. And it is supposed that he also had seen Hedeby and um, the people at that time were convinced that he was at the place like the officials of the Nazi government too. If we compare or why Hedeby was of such an importance for the SS, we could easily compare it with other projects of that time. Just take the Hohe Michele excavations in, um, in Baden-Württemberg in southwestern Germany. So um, Gustav Frieg from Tübingen University, he excavated a huge tumulus of the of the early Hallstatt civilization, so of the area, so of the era before Christ more connected with an early Celtic speaking uh, population as they saw it at that time. And uh, also these uh, excavations were not published before 1962. Another project run by the SS Ahnenerbe dedicated to the supposed oldest work of German architecture was the mausoleum of the Ostrogothic King Theodoric in Ravenna. Um, so this project was uh, was made in 38 to 39, and it was also published in 1971 by the German Archaeological Institute. So both of these projects were um, um, were quali on a qualitatively high standard project of archaeological or architectural research of that time. So we have to take also this into considerations and we have to distinguish between pseudoscience and um, real research projects on a high scientific level um, done by the SS Ahnenerbe. And Hedeby was one of these research projects on a very high scientific level at that time. When 39, uh, World War II uh, came and the Nazis were invading most parts of Europe. Uh, the excavations in Hedeby stopped and uh, Herbert Jankun was switching 
to new, perhaps even more promising projects, like, for example, the Operation Matilda project, so an investigation of the famous Bayeux tapestry in 1941, where he compared um, the functioning of the early Norman state with the functioning of the Nazi state. And um, they took a lot of effort in photographing and drawing the, the Bayeux tapestry, and they planned a three volume publication. And uh, so Jan Kuhn was engaged, as you can see on the left side, in several, um, in several of, these, um, of these special assignment projects during the war, not only in France, but also in Norway and in the Soviet Union. It's um, a lot to discuss about these things, I'm quite aware of this, but for the Hedeby research project and its development, it's uh, at, this, at this point enough to give you the information that even after 1939, Herbert Jankun's career was developing further on and on. And in 1941, he was appointed to a chair of prehistoric archaeology at Rostock University. And besides, he made the career as an officer in the Waffen SS um, in, in the war. And uh, the whole finished uh, in 1945, as you all know. So some, um, some Nazi officials and people were punished for their crimes, like Wolfram Sievers, the head of the SS Ahnenerbe, was the only one of the Ahnenerbe who was sentenced to death in the Nuremberg trials. Others, like Herbert Jankun, were denazified. And you can see that during he was in a prisoner of war camp um, in Ludwigsburg, um, the scientists, they organized a university and they gave a scientific lecture. So Herbert Jankun was talking about um, the actual state of the Viking research at that time. So um, the period after 19, 1945 to 49 is characterized uh, by a second career for, uh, for Herbert Jankun. He was uh, denazified but he had problems in finding a job. And there's him, you can see here, up to 1956, um, um, he had no, that's quite typical for German archeologists of this generation and of that time, that some of them really had problems in finding their way back to uh, professional um, archeology, span but Herbert Jankun succeeded in the 1950s and he was appointed uh, to a chair of archaeology at Göttingen University. The time in, be in between he used um, to uh, work further on uh, what has been achieved so far um, in the excavations, but on a more interpretative level, as you can see here on the right side. So he wrote more papers dedicated uh, to the um, and to the to the um, development between um, a harbor like Hedeby and the harbors in the North Sea and in the Baltic Sea. Or here it's a paper especially on the question on the, of the development of the Frankish and Frisian um, uh, trade in the Baltic in the early Middle Ages. But he also prepared new fieldwork campaigns starting on a very low and small level. And after he was um, he was uh, elected as chair of archaeology at Göttingen University, he restarted these activities, especially by excavating with his students in the so-called southern burial ground and the southern settlement. And you can see here on the photo, uh, so behind the excavation um, had uh, Heiko Steuer, we see Herbert Jankun, and they were discussing features of their excavations. And uh, the old publication by uh, Herbert Jankun, so his book on Hedeby, was revised in several editions. And the last eighth edition was published in 1986. 
and only um, a part of the foreword had to be discarded from the new edition. And you can see it here on the slide that this was uh, too um, national socialist thinking, and that's why they cut it out of the text. But it was still in use, and um, the main excavations were, um, were led by new people, by a new generation, um, so by Kurt Schietzel, who came uh, to, the, to the fieldwork and who started with the fieldwork in 1963. And, um, but uh, also still, um, Kurt Schietzel was still working on the uh, verdict to have a precise layout plan in Hedebe's urban center. So you see, as I already told you, they were enlarging more and more uh, the excavation areas to get a better understanding of the layout of that a huge settlement complex. So we can ask today, um, is it still of any significance uh, to discuss this misuse of an archaeological site during the Nazi period? And um, with this slide, I would tell you, yes, it is. You can see here an article published in September 2021. You could think that it's good advertising for our Viking Museum, Heiterbu Perle an der Förde, but it's published in the journal Deutsche Stimme of the National Democratic Party of Germany. And the only researcher named in this article is Herbert Jan Kuhn, and the fact that the SS Research Fellowship Deutsches Ahnenerbe was making these investigations. So an article just some days old, and we still have to, um, to um, enlighten the people about uh, the, um, the history of this place and what is in between. So today we are able to distinguish five different phases of research strategies. I have put them on this slide. And um, I, will, I would like to present to you that after 120 years of investigations, we have collected a huge amount of information. As you can see here, 44,000 constructive timbers only from settlement excavations over 2,000 constructive timbers um, from the harbor and 1,641 post holes in the harbor, circa 170,000 pottery shirts. Um, we have about um, 6,000 fragments of millstones weighing over 1,000 kilograms and so on and so on. And um, you can believe me that until today, it is, we can find quite astonishing things in our, in our magazines, and this happened quite recently. So some weeks ago, my colleague Ulrich Schmölke, um, he informed me that he wanted to sample whale bone fragments to have uh, better um, determinations of the species behind it. And then we realized that in the whale bones collected in the archaeology, archaeozoological collection, there were also worked parts of whale bone, which were totally unknown for us. Um, here you see these two bones. The smaller fragment is weighing over 100 gram. And these um, two parts of worked whale bone are belonging to these um, enigmatic early Viking period whale bone plaques and the decoration on the Edible piece is closely um, comparable to these three plaques from northern Norway. Um, you can see the distribution on the map to the right. So something totally new and totally unknown until two weeks. So you see also on this map, that we have other places, Birka, Liebe, Dublin, so also the central places for trade and production of the Viking period could provide objects of 
pieces of objects like this. And I'm looking much forward, not only for the determination of the whale species, but also for the precise find circumstance of these two objects, because they must come due to the, to the, to the level, to, to the horizon and, uh, of the coordinates from a Carol Lynch period context. And yeah, that's very typical for the work with such a huge research um, topic. So Hedeby belongs to this complex topic of, um, of the early medieval trading uh, settlements, the so-called Vix or Emporia. So Hedeby is um, connecting the North Sea Basin network with the Baltic Sea Basin network and is therefore of such an importance for the um, for an answering of these questions. This research topic is characterized by a huge amount of scientific studies and by a very vivid um, discussion of um, of the um, of these places, of these early urban centers. And um, so in the last years, for example, the development of these um, sea-based um, emporia um, have been emphasized, for example, by um, Chris Tuss and by Franz Theus in two um, seminal papers. Uh, published in 2020 and relying more on the relations between these coastal developments and their surrounding inland regions, the interactions between these regions and bottom-up developments, um, which were at the start for this, um, urban, uh, uh, for this urbanism in these parts of Northwestern Europe. But you see also have encircled on this um, map in Christus' paper, Liebe and not Hedeby, because Liebe is the older place. For the 7th and 8th century, Hedeby had a totally different functioning. And if we would like to understand the development in southern Scandinavia, we have to go to Liebe, which is directly linked via the Wadden Sea Zone with these developments around the Southern North Sea area. Hedeby is the younger place, but um, as you have already seen on earlier slides, Hedeby is, um, is taking profit from its better locations in Liebe. In, uh, in a paper published in 2007, Michael McCormick stressed the significance of the location for the development of the Carolingian economy with two places, Venice in the eastern, uh, in the eastern, um, in the Adriatic Sea for the eastern Mediterranean area, and Hedeby for having access to the Baltic area. So I have tried to, to put it on the map that you can see it. So both are lying in border situations and both are connecting the Carolingian Empire with further worlds apart, the Eastern Mediterranean and with the Baltic Sea. And looking into the materials from Hedeby, we can see and clearly understand uh, due to new investigations of the last two decades, um, the Carolingian influence at uh, the southernmost part of Scandinavia. So, um, Hedeby is the place in Scandinavia where we have these continental, these continental influences for the large, for the for the strongest um, visible in the archaeological remains. And some years ago, Søren Sindbeck he made such a network representation uh, for pottery vessels in over 150 settlement sites in the North Sea basin and the Baltic Basin, and you can see that uh, Hedeby is really located in the center. So that's the, the impact of its um, topographical location at the narrowest part of the Atlantic Peninsula and between Scandinavia in the north and, um, 
mainland Europe, the continent in the south. When we are coming to the development of the archaeological research questions, um, it is clear that today we are not working any longer only on a precise layout plan um, in Hedeby's supposed urban center around, um, around the harbor, but we have switched um, our interest more to questions related with the anatomy and history of a site at STDB against the background of its power political and economic background. So since 2002, we are dealing more and more with um, a temporal subdivision of the settlement development, taking into consideration that TDB wasn't the same place in the 8th century, nor in the 9th, or in the middle of the 11th century. So now it's, uh, we have brought um, to light that um, we do have an oldest uh, horizon of pre-Viking period date, and which relates this place more to a farmstead than to a trading emporium. So apparently, when Liebe was uh, the trading emporium of the Danish king or a Danish king in the western part of southern Scandinavia, Hedeby was apparently more a farmstead and developed not before the early 9th century into a trading town, into such um, an emporium due to the archaeological materials found. So, for example, the Shatter coinage of the 8th century, which is so well known in Liebe and its environments. So we have about, I think it's about 250 shatters in Liebe and its environments, and in Hedeby we only have two. But later, from the 820s onwards, we have an own coinage minted apparently in Hedeby. And in the late 9th century, we could testify, we could, we could verify um, a building boom in Hedeby's harbor. Um, and in the building of wooden harbor jetties. We are also connecting more and more aspects of trade with new um, aspects of um, processes of production, as it has been pointed out um, last year by Steve Ashby and Sören Sinsbeck. So since some years, we also try to um, collect more information, not only connected um, for a typochronological uh, identification of the objects, which is still the basis, but to invent more material analysis and connect it um, with, um, with the process or with the different processes of production and um, the social agency of technology and of things, how um, Ashby and Sinsbeck called it, also with the materials from Hedeby. So this is a typical, um, um, a typical map of, uh, of, um, of um, important um, object uh, found in Hedeby. So these are small 12 to 14 centimeter long prone spoon rims where we have an overwhelming amount found in Hedeby. And we can see on this map that it's really linking um, the North Sea with the Baltic Sea and also the continent with Scandinavia. And uh, behind this picture is, um, the, is, a, is Hedeby's research over the last 20 years. We could now come connect the old excavations so that's an old excavation before the First World War with modern geophysical um, 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 surveying in Hedeby itself. Um, we can um, compare the materials from these old excavations with materials from the large settlement excavations of the 1930s. These um, apps, these these well-preserved combs are from the harbor excavations. And if you look on this slide, you can see here we also have not only the molds 
fragments from workshop areas, but we also have a lead model, which was used for the production of these uh, enigmatic bronze tomb rims, which we have until today in at least four to five different variants. So a next step in this research would be to go further on with material sciences to understand better uh, the production of these objects and if these uh, bronze tomb rings could really be connected with Hedeby. The last aspect which I would like to stress in my paper this evening is that Hedeby presents the opportunity to do metal detecting in an urban environment and not um, in a rural environment. On this slide, you see a typical 11th century stork shape to the right from Hedeby and to the left from a tiny little village in northeastern Lincolnshire named North Ormsby. And you can see that these two shapes are really, really very similar. Both are for metal detecting. The right one from Hedeby is from an urban context. The left one is from a rural context. And from such a rural place like North Ormsby, we have a material which is very typical, which you can find all over Denmark today, and which we can also find in Hedeby itself. And due to Doomsday Book and to um, a will, um, which is recorded um, a bit later, we also know more information about this tiny little place named um, North Ormsby. And um, some years ago, um, Julian Richards and Dave Heldenby, they collected these, what they call diagnostic artifact categories of Viking and Anglo-Scandinavian activity in Yorkshire. And this is a material which we also find all over Denmark, but especially also in Hedeby. And this is a totally new material horizon of late Viking period Hedeby. And this place offers a wonderful possibility for um, an early urban center of the 11th century. And that's something really unique, which stands behind this digital reconstruction um, of Hedeby in the middle of the 10th century which you have already seen at the beginning of my lecture. And I would like to, to finish with this slide. So um, even if we have started about 20 years ago in um, developing um, 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 a better picture of different uh, distinct phases during Hedeby's existence from the 7th to the middle of the 11th century, we are still developing a new research agenda, agenda for Hedeby and its hinterland. So together with the Center of Baltic and Scandinavian Archaeology, the State Archaeological Department of the State of Schleswig-Holstein and the Institute of um, Pre- and Proto- historical archaeology at Kiel University, we are engaged um, in developing further research question, questions and research um, topics for the future. And um, even if these um, efforts were a bit hampered uh, due to the pandemic since last year. So that's what I wanted to um, present to you this evening. And yeah, I hope um, you have enjoyed it. And thank you very much for your patience and your interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Falke, for this uh, brilliant lecture, which I enjoyed very much. Uh, Katka told me that uh, we have to bridge some some uh, seconds before the audience can come in with their comments and questions to your lecture. And I would like to make use uh, of that uh, possibility to once more congratulate uh, for this uh, incredible balance, balancing act between presenting this fantastic site and all the uh, 
uh, insights and possibility it brings combined with uh, a overview about its dark history also and its abuse in uh, Nazi Germany. Um, so that was really well done. Uh, the first question I would like to ask uh, <coughs> for the audience, which is maybe not so acquainted with Hedebu as a site, you mentioned uh, Haitabu, you mentioned Hedebu, you mentioned Schleswig. How is this connected? I know that it's confusing for uh, some <coughs> younger scholars, which haven't uh, dealt with Hedeby before. Yeah, I, I have to admit when I deleted the slide. Um, so that was the slide to explain the name. I'm sorry about this. So in due to, to a runestone found nearby and where the place is named Heiserbü, but in the accusative form um, Heiserbü, and uh, so the German name or the, the, the name used in German language is Heiterbu. In Danish it is Hedebu, and in English we call it Hedebi. And uh, due to the different written testimonies, um, we do have, we know that uh, the different peoples speaking different languages um, use different names. So in um, Old Norse languages, it is named in the early Middle Ages, Heiserbür or Heiserbür. In Old English, it is at Heithum or of Heithum. So it's relating to a settlement on the heath. And in um, Latin um, records from first the Carolingian um, period and realms and later the East Frankish and developing German uh, kingdoms, it is called first Sleesorp and then Sliasvig. And we do have um, a written account of the late 10th century, the Elderman Ethelweird Chronicle, and in the Chronicle, El um, Ethelweird said that um, the Oppidum Capitalis of the Angles because the Anglo-Saxons were aware that their, um, their ancestors were coming from the areas surrounding Hedeby, that um, this place is named by uh, the Scandinavians Heiserbür and by the Saxons um, Sviaspit. And in the late 11th century, Adam of Bremen is reporting something comparable. And that's what the name is in between. Uh, that's what's, what's uh, behind the story of the different names. Thank you very much, Volker. We have, uh, uh, apart from uh, congrats and uh, thank yous for your nice presentation, some first questions here in the chat. And I would like to lift the, the first question by Sophie Hügelin. Uh, is it possible to link the burial place and different practices with different faces? Um... So the different burial places were all in use for a longer period. We um, have to take into consideration that Hedeby is developing um, also in space. So the, um, at the beginning, the, the cemeteries are lying on the higher slopes to the west and the settlement is stretching along the seaside. And then the settlement is, um, is developing further uh, to the west on these um, on these slopes and so there are areas which were first in use for for a graveyard for a cemetery and they were then reused for settlement purposes and we also have uh, in the south we have the different situation that we have the oldest parts of the settlement which were later used for burial grounds so it's more that we have to think that uh, the different burial areas were used for several generations. But um, it's of course depending, and it's also, um, as you Sven did perfectly know, comparing it with the situation in the hill for, that's also one of the, one of the research uh, questions which we still have to solve about um, the, uh, dating of all these barrels, about 50 barrels on the hill floor. And um, yeah, there's still a lot to do. 
Thank you very much. And there's another question by Jerome Baumeister. Um, why has the settlement been abandoned? And one might add, uh, when has the settlement been abandoned? Because we learned it's uh, in discussion the uh, 1050 event as well as the uh, 1066 event for Hedewig. So Hedewig was abandoned um, after the events of uh, in the middle of the 11th century. So 1050, the Norwegian king Harald Sigurdsson, um, he um, plundered Hedewig and in 1066, the abbot priests um, and the Wends were also um, plundering this place. And apparently um, it was the Danish king Sven Estresen who decided to shift the place from this area to the north of the Schleifjord. Um, so the town, the city of Schleswig developed. It was only 10 hectares, 10 to 12 hectares in size. Apparently this was enough. Um, but um, from the 1080s onwards, when, when the harbor was growing more and more, they also had, um, they also had to find new land and uh, they made new embankments in the harbor area. But um, apparently it was um, a, a smaller place in another um, area on a new ground was better suited for a modern um, for a modern urban center, so for a Christian city pass. The problem is that until today, we do not know of any Christian church. So um, in 948, at least nominally, the Ottonian kings erected bishoprics in Liebe, Aarhus, and in Sviaswig. And we do not know if these, uh, where, where a bishop's church was built, if it was already built at that time. And um, even in the late 10th century or from the early 11th century, when the Danish kings were also kings of England, these were Christian kings and the elites and larger parts of the society, they were Christianizing more and more. And the people, they had to bury their dead on Christian graveyards. And we do have in the latest graves in Hedeby, we do have a Christian graveyard, but until today, no remains of the church have, has been found. That's another of these riddles which we have to solve for future research. Right. Thank you for that. At the moment, we have no more uh, questions. If there are more questions to Volker, please write them in the chat and we will lift them up and uh, Volker will surely do his best to to answer them accordingly. Uh, we can wait some more minutes if some more questions will come in. And uh, I could try to rephrase the question you just answered, Volker. Um, why has the settlement been abandoned? You could also ask uh, maybe, why did the settlement survive that long, seeing that Kaupang ends in around 970 and Birka ends in uh, 975? Why? Or how does Hedeby succeed to survive a hundred years longer than the other Viking towns in the north? That's due to the geographical situation of this place. So it's a, it's the best uh, location for connecting the transport or the communication uh, from the continent to Scandinavia, from the North Sea to the Baltic. So uh, that's really the favorable geographic position. Uh, at the narrowest part uh, of the Jutlandic Peninsula, directly here at the Schleswig Isthmus. That's why Hedeby and later Schleswig was of such an importance from the 9th century up to um, the 12th century, up to the Middle Ages. Right. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I don't see any new questions. Uh, there's one. Coming up uh, to actually, we maybe can start with the uh, question by Katarina Botic. Um, mm -hmm. Have you done any dendrochronology for precise dating of construction phases? Uh, yes, <laughs> we have done a lot of dendrochronology and especially my colleague, now I have to point to, to, to which way, to this direction. 
spent time doing. He worked on the dendrochronology of the harbor excavations, and my colleague Joachim Schulze on the dendrochronology of the settlement excavations. But um, the research for the dendrochronology of the settlement excavations is not uh, has not been finished yet. So it's still a lot of work waiting. Thank you for that. And then we can continue. Now uh, questions are coming in by uh, Barbara, Barbara Ambruska. Um, did the last 20 years of excavation and research bring further information about the origin of raw materials, more precisely of metals? Yes, it uh, has done. Hello, Barbara, nice to hear from you. Um, yes, we have had um, since 2012 um, a research project financed by the Volkswagen Foundation, and we work together with the German with the German Mining Museum in Bochum. So Stephen Merkel wrote his PhD on Hedeby Silver, and uh, for our um, for our project or for my um, Hedeby publication in print for next year, he was also analyzing the base metals. And we can um, much better understand how metals were coming uh, from, for example, Central Asia via the Dirham uh, horizon into the Baltic and also to Hedeby, but also via other objects. And uh, when it was later replaced, so from the third quarter of the 10th century, it was replaced more and more by metal coming from Central Europe, so from the Deutsche Mittelgebirge, from the Harz in the east up to um, up to the um, Sauerland in the west. So Stephen Merkel already published some of his results in his uh, PhD monograph in, in different articles, and uh, you will find it on academia. What is it? Uh, EU, EDU. Yes. EDU, yes, exactly. It's from the United States, sorry. Yeah, and you will find this information there, or I have published uh, from the um, from a conference um, in Bochum some years ago, a paper on the metal, on Hedeby's metal supply in the Viking period relating to these questions. Thank you, Volker. We have two more questions. One, uh, by Sophie Hügelin once more. Do you have remains of ships or shipbuilding? Yeah, we do have four ships found until today in the harbor. Um, the long ship Wreck 1 has been totally excavated. Wreck 3 is the largest, uh, until today, the largest known cargo vessel of the Viking period, um, built after 1023. Uh, we have another shipwreck of mid 10th century date built in a what is called a Slavonic tradition, so using wooden um, wooden nails and not the iron rivets. And we have an what's in Danish terminology an early medieval ferry boat of the 1130s. But boathouses, as far as I know, are not known until today. Or do you know? One in the harbor area, I think. Not from Hedeby, neither uh, workshops, boat, boat building sites, they are not known. Mm -hmm. In the small area excavated. Yeah, and in Schleswig, it's the same. So. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then there's one last question uh, by, by Matt Edgeworth. Uh, do you think that Haitabu provided a kind of model for the layout of other Viking settlements, such as the Longford sites in Ireland? Yeah, that's an interesting that's an interesting question. Perhaps we can think in this way. I do not. I'm not quite convinced, but I think it's quite um, interesting to note that apparently the relation between Hedeby and um, the, the the Viking activity zones in the West, so what will later be the Danelaw or even the British Isles and Scandinavian influence or settled parts of the British Isles were in a much closer context than thought before. So there's um, new material which points in this direction. And I was also thinking about 
these possibilities. So um, yeah, it could be we we have to to compare it further on. A good question, a good um, a good idea to to think about it. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the uh, it is uh, eight o'clock p.m. and I think uh, we can round off this. Uh, Lovely keynote of yours, Volker, with the question of mine. Maybe I can take just this privilege as moderator. Uh, in the presentation, we've heard that you just concluded your manuscript on the late Hedebu, late, uh, Hedebu, Hedebu AD 983 to 1066 and uh, 780 pages. And I'm very curious to, to hear what was the most exciting or astonishing result of your thesis. Uh, you, you'd reckon? Mm, I would say um, that how all these things fit together. So for me, it was absolutely astonishing which active role Hedeby is still playing in the first half of the 11th century, and especially um, with uh, in these events coming up after 1012, when the Danish kings conquered England. So it's really absolutely amazing um, to see these connections between these two parts. And now um, it's, it's, uh, we can much better understand um, um, not only Hedeby's development, but also Denmark's part in these uh, political and economic affairs. And what fits very well to the situation is just think from Hedeby to the Harz Mountains, it's about 300 kilometers. So the supply of metals, which were needed in a huge amount, um, they could have been brought quite easily to Hedeby. And that's the other aspect, the astonishing new aspect, um, especially for, for the first third of the 11th century, that we really have um, a strong influence from uh, the East Frankish German Kingdom. So not only from the Harz area, but also from the Cologne area. So that was uh, what um, yeah, attracted me most. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, I thought to round off uh, this, this session, but uh, there's one last question coming in. And since we avoided to address uh, one of the main part of your topics, the uh, uh, Nazi... Um, interactions with the with the site of Hedeby, the Nazi research, uh, which I was happy for, actually. I must really honestly say that uh, the focus was on the uh, Viking uh, evidence. And as a, a Viking scholar, of course, I'm very happy to, to focus on this, what is close to our hearts. But since this is also part of your topic, uh, Michael Nice lifted an important question, which maybe can be answered to conclude this session. Did Scandinavian scholars interact with the Jan Kuhn and co at all? And how long did those corporations last? Um, yeah, a good question. Thank you, Michael. In June or July 1939, the director of the Danish National Museum, Paul Merlund, he wanted to visit the excavations. So just some weeks before, uh, the Nazis invaded Poland. And from 1930 onwards, Scandinavian archaeologists did um, participate in the excavations. So from all over, uh, from Denmark, from Sweden, um, not from, from Norway, and uh, really Herbert Jan Kuhn, he was inviting colleagues, and he was also inviting colleagues uh, from Finland, for example. So um, Holger Abmann was there, Helmer Salmo was there, uh, Roas Coleman was excavating, was taking part in the excavations. Then, um, I'm a bit tired now, perhaps you can help me, Sven, uh, uh, the Swedish archaeologist who excavated in Sigtuna, he, he, um, mm. um, it was, um, what's, What's the name? I can have a look to my to my books behind me, but unfortunately, I couldn't um, get too far away from my computer. So uh, several people were engaged and participated actively 
But of course, there were also sharp discussion, discussions already in the 1930s. And uh, Herbert Jan Kuhn, he was what we would say, he was a true archaeologist. He was really uh, a convinced archaeologist. And he really, um, he divided between archaeology and these other politically uh, emphasized um, um, things. So for example, we absolutely have only photos of archaeological features. There's only, out of thousands of photos of the 1930s, there's only one photo with someone in a uniform. So he, they must have taken care of this aspect. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And Michael is helping us with a name from uh, Sigtina, the researcher, Fluderos. Yes, Eric Fluderos. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Colleague, yes. Um, okay, I would like to close the discussion now um, and uh, maybe ask one final question. How long did it take to, for Hedeby Research to, to make it back into the international community and into the discussions after World War II, Volker? I think it was not changing before Herbert Jankun, uh, sorry, before Kochitze took over in the 1960s. Of course, um, I know of correspondences of Herbert Jankun with uh, with other researchers in Belgium, for example. Um, so um, he was still engaged, but there were countries where he was not um, welcome. In Norway, for example, quite clear, and um, yeah, it was more in the in the later 1960s and 1970s, and even later with uh, researchers like Michael Müller Wille and Klaus von Karnach Bornheim that uh, the Hedeby research um, was more or less fully integrated into um, international research. But that's also quite typical for the last decades of archaeological research, as you all may know, as you all know. Okay, thank you, Volker, very much. Uh, I would say a warm row of applause, uh, if we weren't digitally, uh, for your uh, thrilling keynote tonight. And um, thank you for once more for taking the time for presenting Hedebu, both as an archaeological site and also in terms of his uh, its history of research. So well done, Volker. Thank you very much. And everybody in the audience, uh, Volker told me and before that he is happy to uh, to address further questions uh, if you would send him an email. Volker had his email address in his presentation. You can find it either in the program, EA program, or else at the homepage of Schloss Gotthoff itself and uh, please feel free to to stay in touch to get in touch uh, with Volker. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and I hope you enjoy EAA in the upcoming days. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.